thank you. Boy, I tell you, I love our praise team. Y'all know that, and I, I guarantee you, I just am amazed at that, uh, everything they do uh, and how they do it. It's just a, such a great thing, and I, I know many times in church, you know, you, you guys come from all kinds of past in church. Many of you have been in church lots of your life, m- much of your life. And you've seen church change in the styles and the way it does things and so forth. And uh, now you're in, in Freedom River, and we do this type of uh, praise and worship type music that's a lot more contemporary and all of that. And I know some of you are out of your comfort zone. You like hymns, and we love hymns. I was brought up in hymns. Matter of fact, I may sing a little hymn uh, actually today in the message if the, if the Lord helps me remember what it is. But um, there's this old, 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 old. How many of you have ever heard an old, old, old? I mean, this would be like from the old Broadman hymnal. If you, if you can remember back that far in the 50s, you can remember the old Broadman hymnal. You used to go to church and they'd tell you to turn to number 158 or something like that. And it'd be an old, and some of them even have shape notes. And I know some of you don't even know what shape notes are, but you used to sing by the shape of the note, you know. And, oh, that's way back. But, but it was a song called Little Is Much When God Is In It. And it's just a little old hymn. It's kind of like, almost like Amazing Grace. It, it just says, you know, in the mark. And I'm not going to sing much of it, Chris, so you don't have to give me all that effects and stuff. He tries to help me because my voice, you know, kind of, I'm trying to shake you. But, but it just says, uh, in the mark, it place now ripen. There's a work for us to do. Hark, the voice of God is calling to the harvest, calling you. Little as much when God is in it. Labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown and you can win it. If you go in Jesus' name. How many of you remember that classic? Okay, well, there. I must be the oldest person here. But anyway, uh, (laughs) they probably didn't have that in black church. You know, I'm serious. That wasn't one, y'all. That probably wasn't one y'all got out on, you know. (laughs) But but anyway... (laughs) But anyway, we go, we, we, we have all these traditions is what it boils down to. Brother Charles looking like he, man, you didn't go to church when you were young. What you talking about? But anyway, brother, brother, brother Charles went to Nat King Cole Church. That's what he went to. Yeah, Nat King Cole Church. I guarantee you he's 82, 82 years old now, Brother Charles, 82. He's so old he can't even remember. 81. I gave you a year, okay? Well, at least, at least I've come down. He's 82. He doesn't even know it. But anyway, but anyway, 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 any Nat King Cole song you want to sing, brother, he can just launch out on it right there. And we get Brother Charles to sing because he has a beautiful voice and we love him and he's got such a great spirit and heart and testimony. And we, and we have, but we have to teach him these songs. I mean, like Amazing Grace, How Sweet Sound, he had to learn that and you know, uh, my tribute to God be the glory that, oh, An- that Andre Crouch used to sing. To God be the glory. I mean, you know, I had to teach him because he didn't grow up learning these kind of songs. Yeah, oh, he was Catholic? Is that what it was? Well, that's fine. Never mind. I don't want to cast any reflection on all Catholics, okay? Because, I mean, hey, <clears throat> we can say, Lawrence moving away. That's right, baby. I'd move away too. I'm serious. To God. But anyway, anyway, uh, uh, we, we're from a, we're, we, we would be called, we, we are what you would call an eclectic group. We're just all this varied amalgamation of all these different things. Some of you came from Pentecostal backgrounds. Some of you came from Church of God. Some of you came from Missionary Baptist, Southern Baptist, National Baptist, Catholic, uh, Episcopal, Lutherans, uh, Methodist, Presbyterians, whatever it might be. You used to be you used to be something like that, you know. And there's nothing wrong. I mean, hey, uh, a lot of times your past has made you what you are. So I mean, we're not trying to put down on the fact that you were associated with something great in the past. But now God has brought you into something brand new like this. And I know it's a challenge a lot of times because you have to kind of let the Lord give you a, a hunger for the style and the, everything about what we do. And, uh, you know, when I was growing up, this is just a short testimony. When I was growing up, I grew up in a little country Baptist church. Well, I say little. It was, you know, 200, 250 people, so it wasn't all that little. Great, really a great church, my home church. Uh, that's where I was called to preach. That's where I was saved. Uh, Man, this was a great church. I'm, I'm not meaning to mock it in any way, but I'm just to show you how times have changed. The church I grew up in when I was a, when I was a youth, when I was like 16, 17 years old, youth choir was a really big thing. I don't know if you guys remember when youth choir was a big thing. All the youth wanted to be in a youth choir, 
And then all of a sudden, I don't know whether the youth union got together and they all said, voted and said, we don't think choir's cool anymore. So all of a sudden, you woke up one day and people, the youth didn't want to be in a choir anymore. But back then, we did want to be in one. And we would have a youth choir and our choir would go to other churches and sing youth musicals and stuff like that. And, we, and we, other churches would come to our church and sing youth musicals and all that kind of stuff. Well, our church, just to show you how things have changed, our church would not allow a youth group to come into our church that played the music that they sang to on a tape. You know, back then we had, I mean, I know some of you don't even know what a cassette tape is, but back then we had cassette tapes and before cassettes were reel to reel. And so you'd have a reel to reel player up here and it would have the music and the music would be all these instruments you see up here. And it would play in the background, and the choir would sing with the music that was provided by a band or an orchestra from some, you know, on the tape. Well, our church wouldn't even allow a tape like that to be played in the church because it had drums on it and it had guitars on it. And according to the elders, uh, that was unsanctified and unholy. The only, the only instruments that Jesus uh, authenticated to be used in the church was a piano and an organ. That was it. Now, how they came up with that, I'll never know. But, but anyway, uh, but that was it, you know. And so they couldn't even play the tracks to sing with because it had instruments that weren't approved to pl be played in the church. So now, now you walk in here, and we look like, you know, a stage up here at some concert somewhere or something like that. Uh, somebody would probably say, you look like a bar club. Well, it, it's not. I mean, the whole... The whole intention is to, to use the instruments to praise the Lord. There is yeah, a, yeah. There's a Hebrew word, and I, I'm really trying not to preach a whole other sermon, but, but there, there are seven words in the Hebrew language for the word praise. Toda, yada, barak, shabar, and then the word zamar. And zamar means to praise the Lord with an instrument. So one of the Hebrew words that is used for praise is a word that signifies that when a musician gets on an instrument and plays that instrument to the glory of God, that is a form of praise to God that he receives and enjoys. And, and I know our guys, uh, that's the intent of their heart, that this would praise the Lord. It's just another something, the talent that God has given me, the discipline that it took to learn this and to do this and to be together. Um, that's an offering to God as a praise to him. And all of us have those kind of things in our life. And so anyway, I'm, I, what I'm saying all that to just to brag on you guys and to say to you, um, you know, if everything's not your cup of tea, hang in there, okay? I mean, just, just hang in there because God will give you a love for it and a passion for it. If God's called you to be a part of Freedom River Church, he'll give you whatever you need to, 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 uh, to grasp and to, and to sense and to feel. I know Bev for a long time. Beverly's been, Beverly was one of our founding elders with us, you know, uh, totally involved in everything in Lawrence. And uh, they came from National Baptist in Chicago, which basically was, is, the, is a black church, to, pretty much totally black, uh, in, a in a community that's totally black, and their culture was spirit, you know, like spiritual music, which are like the black spiritual music, like you hear even alive today, and they have the background singers, and they do all the, you know, fancy things, and, and they have different lines that go into, you know, where it's totally different than this style of music right here, and for a long time, she, she tried to be very gentle about it because she didn't want to sound critical, but she encouraged us to do some of that. And it wasn't that we rejected it or didn't want to do that, but it was we just didn't have the we didn't have the background group, we didn't have some of the things to do music like that, and so uh, you know we would we would not be able to do a lot of it. Like every once in a while, we'd try to do a little fleck of this and a fleck of that. But the point, my point is that now, if you ask her, she used to listen on the on the radio and on K Love and different places like that to that style of music before she would come to church, almost like okay. I'm 
I'm going to feed my spiritual singing soul, and then I'm going to go to church and love my church and love my pastor and love the Word and everything like that. But I need, I'm hungry for a little bit of this, so I need to, I'm putting it in myself so I can kind of get ready before I get there. But now, if you ask her what kind of music you like, it would be this right here. It'd be like, boy, I love that. Glory to God. I'm hungry for that. She, she doesn't listen to it on the radio anymore. I mean, the past is gone is what I'm saying to you. And, and, and what you need to love where you are and thrive where you are, be uh, to move forward where you are, to be an encouragement to your pastor, an encouragement to your church, an encouragement to each other, to be totally enveloped in what God has commissioned uh, the church that he's called you to. And I do believe that God calls you to a church. I, I know God gives you a shepherd. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me and they will not follow another because they don't recognize his voice. And I'm just saying to you that if I'm your pastor, God lets you hear my voice. Yeah. And I know some of you have been lots of places and you say, I don't remember anything about it. It never meant anything to me. I could go there and never even sense God speaking to me whatsoever. It was like I was a, in a lost world somewhere. And now you said, I walked in the door and man, when you get up there, it just goes straight to my heart. I hear everything there. I can tell you when I, when I leave, I can tell you what it was about and what it meant and all of those kind of things. Well, you know what that indicates? I'm your pastor. Jesus said he had a flock and his flock would hear his voice. And others that are not part of the flock, they might hear him speak, but they didn't, li they didn't hear what he said. They might be listening, but they didn't hear. And so if Jesus, our great shepherd, has a flock that hears his voice and they follow him as an under-shepherd of Jesus Christ, I have a flock. And my flock will hear my voice. And my voice will matter. My voice will make a difference. I could get up here and read, Mary had a little lamb as fleece was white as snow, and the Holy Spirit would apply that to your heart, and you'd walk out of here going, that is the greatest message I ever heard in my life. What in the world? I didn't know about Mary and the sheep, you know, and all of that kind of stuff. And, and I'm just saying that, that's an indication that you're in the right place. That's an indication that if God's going to challenge your soul, convict your heart, move you in a direction, speak to you like you need to hear, he's going to do it through your shepherd. And your shepherd matters. And all, everybody that's listening on Facebook Live and all of that kind of stuff, you have a shepherd and, yeah. and you seek your shepherd. You know, I've had people say, you know, do I need to go here or there or do I, what do I need to do? You know, this church, you know, so-and-so used to be pastor and is not pastor anymore. Now I'm moving on and blah. Do I need to move? Or what do I need to do? And, and, and you have this sense of loyalty to where you are and you don't want to leave somewhere and this kind of stuff. But, but I'm telling you, uh, life is too treacherous. Times are too short. It's too dangerous for you to live in this world and not hear from God. You belong to him. He's going to speak to you. And he's going to speak through the voice of your shepherd He's going to speak to you through the voice of your flock. God speaks to us in four ways primarily today through the Bible. When you read it, it speaks to you. You've read verses, and those verses never said anything, and all of a sudden now when you read it, you go, man, I can't believe what God just said. That's the Bible speaking to you. The Bible, prayer, when you pray, God moves in your heart. He gives you a sense inside of you. And, and so God speaks these days by the Bible, prayer, circumstances, all kinds of things happen to you. Doors are open, doors are shut. Opportunities are there. You see things you've never seen before. Things happen and it comes in and you go, oh my Lord, that's God's speak. God speaks through the Bible. God speaks through prayer. God speaks through circumstances and the church. And the church is just not me as the preacher. The church is all of us, the body, everybody here that knows Christ it can speak and not even know they're talking to you and all of a sudden you'll hear it and it'll go right to your heart and just pew, like a jet, like a bullet and, and the Holy Spirit will open up avenues of understanding and conviction and comfort and compassion and everything else that you need in order to lead you and that is vital for you to capture and hang on to. So it's not just important that you come to church because that's the thing to do. You come to church because you need to hear God, because you need to be challenged by God. I'm not saying the sermon or the music. I'm saying God speaks to you, and he uses these human instruments to do it with. And so welcome. I encourage you. I don't know why I got off on that rant, but 
Anyway, you, hey, look at your neighbor and say, you never know. <laughs> yeah, you, you never know where he's going. <laughs> All I'm telling you, I got a, I got a, whole, I got a whole two pages of, of notes that, for you that you got handed out, and I know that's not on any of them. You're going, where is that? You know? Well, I don't know. Where is it, Lord? But anyway, let's look at the church. We've looked, this is our, what, uh, sixth church today. Mm. One more. One more, Laodicea, which you won't want to miss that, I can guarantee you. It's a doozy. The church at Laodicea is the last church who thought they were rich, but God said, no, you're poor. Which, in contrast, the church at Smyrna, the second church, the little persecuted church, they thought they were poor, but God said, you're rich. So it's the perspective of God, you know? Some of you may think you're poor, but God looks at you and says, no, you rich. You're rich, you're blessed, you have health, you have life, you have influence, you have resources, you have money, you have a job, you have a great brain, you have education, you have all these opportunities. So you don't look at yourself and think, man, I'm poor. God says, you're rich. But the trouble at Laodicea was they were blind, they had eye problems. Say to your neighbor, eye problems. Yeah, I, when I is the center of everything, they were deceived. They looked at themselves and they didn't see anything wrong. They didn't see anything bad. God says, when I look at you, you know what I see? Somebody who thinks they're rich, but they're poor. So anyway, that's next week. Let's, today is Philadelphia, which is a whole different scenario. This is the only church that Jesus didn't really say anything negative to. He didn't say, I got a problem with you. This is what needs to happen. He didn't really get negative against Sardis. You remember Ephesus was the first church, and it was the church that had good doctrine, but they had lost their first love, or left, excuse me, left their first love. So they had a good doctrine, good sound teaching, but they just didn't have the heart anymore. And then the second church was Smyrna, and Smyrna was that little persecuted church that that were they were they didn't they didn't have any money and they couldn't they couldn't meet half the time because uh, the government was stirred up against them. And every time they tried to go forward, some regulator or some IRS agent or some uh, some bureau or something would shut them down and, and harass them and all of that kind of stuff. Which uh, same th stuff is happening today, just like that everywhere against the Spirit of God. Believe me, I, I guarantee you, if you were on the inside, you'd know this. It's very difficult to do things as a Christian nowadays uh, because of that kind of a spirit that comes against the kingdom of God. Very subtle, but it's there. And, and Jesus really didn't have anything negative to say against Smyrna. He just tried to encourage them and so forth. But Philadelphia is the evangelistic church. It's the, it's the uh, missionary church that came to life because of how terrible the, the church at Sardis was. The church at Sardis represented an age of dead church. You remember, he says, you have a name that you're alive, but you're dead last week. Everybody thinks, let's go to First Church Sardis because it's got a name, boy, it's happening down at First Church. People in Ephesus would say, hey, if you move to, if you move to Sardis, make sure you get down to First Church because that's where the fire is. That's where things... And it became a trap for people, for hungry-hearted spiritual people because it had a name that it was alive, but when people got in there, it was a trap, a spiritual death trap. It was dead. And so out of that deadness, and I want you to hear me when I say this because we see the same thing happening in America today. We see the same thing with government and with spiritual life and with every other life. When things get so bad, when things get so dead, things get so shut down, that it, it becomes dead. Out of that deadness, and, and please hear me when I say this, out of that deadness, God moves in the heart of his children and the reformers, I mean people who have a passion, people who have a heart for God, are called out of that deadness. It is the deadness that inspires them. It is the deadness that makes them hear the voice of God and say, this is ridiculous. This can't stay this way. And so God begins to call people like William Carey, which is one of the great Baptist leaders, got a college in Hattiesburg named William Carey University, uh, named after William Carey that went to India and carried the gospel there and, and just started a whole Christian work on the whole continent of India. Uh, people like George Whitfield, people like Jonathan Edwards, maybe some of you know these names and you've never heard some of these names. 
uh, the John Wesley. These were people uh, that, that were called out of the deadness. The deadness around them made them look and say, this makes me sick. This is ridiculous. God wants a new direction. God, and they began to have little clandestine meetings with the people who had a heart, heart, hot heart. Say, look, I know, man, church is deader than a hammer, man. You never even get anything from God. Well, come on, I'm gonna have a Bible study over here Tuesday night, and you're invited. And they began to gather little groups and, and begin to, and, and the embers of God were there, and the Spirit of God through the men of God who had passion and compassion and hated the deadness of the time, they began to blow on those embers, and those embers began to and the fire of God began to initiate in these groups and, and, it, and, it, and, it, and it burst into a flame called the church at Philadelphia. So God had nothing bad to say to these missionary evangelistic churches that lived not for themselves but lived for others, to reach others, to minister to others. And, and, and God, just, I mean, Jesus, he, you, you know, the pattern that Jesus has been speaking and when he says, uh, let me tell you who's talking to you, and he uses things like the one with eyes of fire, the ones with feet of brass, the ones that hold the seven stars, the one that are in the candle lampstands in the midst of the church. All of those are terms of judgment. And when he spoke to these other churches that were, you know, intepid, they were lukewarm, they were carnal, they were backbiting, fighting, fussing, ridiculous carnal institutions rather than the Spirit of God, when he spoke to them, he said, I've got eyes like fire, I've got feet like brass, I got, you know, I'm piercing through, I'm going to crush you under. I mean, those were all judgment words because those churches were ridiculous representations of what was supposed to be the Spirit of God. But Jesus breaks the pattern on this one because he doesn't have anything negative to say. He doesn't present himself as somebody with feet like brass. Why? Because this church doesn't need any judgment. This church is, has the heart of God. This church is missionary. It's a, it seeks something besides itself. It's reaching out to the world. It's evangelistic. It has the heart of God. God just looks at them and basically says, I'm happy that, that, to be in your midst. And so let's see what he had to say. You'll see what I'm talking about here. Let's just read what he says. Verse 7, and, the, and to the angel, everybody say the pastor, okay, to the missionary, to the one who's leading this church, and to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, these things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. I know your works which he says to all of them, which just means I got my eye on you. In other words, when God looks at you, you don't have to wonder, does he know what's going on in my life? Every one of these churches starts with, I know your works. In other words, I'm not trying to come against you or speak positively about you for no reason. I'm paying attention to what's happening to you. You may think God doesn't know what's going on in your life. But I'm going to tell you something. You're not that hard to find. I hear people say, when I might ask them occasionally, How are, how's your relationship with the Lord? And they'll make a statement like, oh, Pastor, I'm running from God. Uh, my question is, where are you running? <laughs> yeah, right. Where are you going to go? I mean, believe me, I can find you. You don't think God can find you? You're not that hard to find. I mean, come on. And so anyway, he, he says, I see your work. See, I've set before you an open door, and no one can shut it, for you have a little strength. Okay, they don't have a lot of power, but they still have some strength. So you have a little strength. You have kept my word, and you have not denied my name. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie, Indeed, I'll make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you because you have kept my command to persevere. I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole earth to test those who dwell upon the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have that no, that no one may take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God. And I will write on him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. 
Whew, what a word. I know you're sitting there. You know, I, and looking over my notes this morning, and I don't know why I didn't see it before this morning, but I know I left out because I try to write these notes so that, you know, when you go out of here, things that might be a little complex or complicated, you know, that, that might be a little difficult for you to understand, I try to put them in these notes I hand out to you so you will you can walk away and say, okay, I understand that. And I, under, and I saw that I left out like verses 9, 10, and 11, which are probably have the most, some of the most complex things in them that you need to understand. I didn't write a word about it. I thought I did, but it was, evidently Pastor Tanya took it out. I don't know. Um, she's my editor, by the way. Yeah, I write them, and then she makes them readable for you. And um, anyway, so she probably thought, hey, they don't need that. But, but anyway, uh, uh, we'll, we'll look at it because I know you're going, what in the world is that talking about? Let's look at who wrote it to them just, just as a little entrance. Uh, notice to the angel of the church in, in Philadelphia, write, these things says he who is holy. Okay, so God is holy. He said, I'm holy. And he says, you're holy. So that means that we have a relationship with each other. You're holy and I'm holy. How are you made holy? You're not made holy by what you do. You can't make yourself holy. That's why you need a Savior. Our problem is, as human beings, we can't be holy. That's why we have to have a Savior. And he says, all right, I'm holy and you're holy, which just means we have a relationship with each other. So he's saying, the one who's talking to you is holy, and you're holy, so good. We have a good, clean relationship. And he says, I'm, the one who's speaking to you is true. And that doesn't mean that he just tells the truth. It means he is the truth. God does not tell the truth. God is the truth. And so he says, all right, here's our relationship we're related to each other because I'm holy and you're holy and I'm truthful and you live in truth, all right? So what does somebody who has a good relationship with God and who knows the truth, what do they, what do they need in order to go out into the world? They need two things. They need a door that is open so they can walk through and they need the resources to use once they walk through. So see what he says to them. He's holy, he's true. Now here he goes. And, and he who has the key of David, and he opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. All right, somebody that is holy and somebody that is true, what do they do? They want to share. They want to go out. They want to bring others in. They want to they minister. So what do they need? First of all, they need for the door to be open. And what this verse says is, I'm the one that opens the door. But notice also he says, I'm the one who shuts the door. So what he's saying to us there is, I have an open door, but that door is not going to always be open. And once I shut the door, nobody's going through the door anymore. So the challenge is, while the door is open, you know, the Bible says, Jesus, of course, it's a complete misrepresentation of what the verse means, but hopefully not a misapplication of what it means. Jesus says, whatever you do, do quickly. Uh, he was talking about, you know, his death on the cross and, you know, whatever thou do, do as quickly. Uh, that's where the verse was. But the application of that is he would look at all of us and he would say, look, I've opened a door for you, but I'm just telling you, you need to go on and walk on through that thing and quit meandering around and don't lollygag because that door's not always going to be open so quickly. Come on, man, get through the door because once I shut the door, Nobody's going to be able to open it. But he, and so we need an open door. So Jesus says, I'm the one that opens the door. Uh, and, and, he, and, and then he says, and you need some resources. You need some money. You need some, you need some people. You need some talent. You need some ability. You need all kinds of resources to minister to those that are outside the door once you walk through the open door. So he says, I'm going to give you the key of David. I'm the, I'm the key of David. And I know most of you have never heard of the key of David, but if you read Isaiah in chapter 22, I think it's verse 22, I put it in your notes for you, that there's the key of David that's mentioned there. And, and, and not just during, Israel was in bondage. They had a guy named Shebna, and that's not important that you remember his name, but he was a foreigner. He was not a Jew. He was not part of the Israel, but he was the treasurer during a time before a captivity came on Israel, and, and he had the key. Well, Shebna would keep the, the treasury of Israel locked up so that the people of Israel could not get the resources out that they needed to fight the battles against the enemy and all of that. And so God took Shebna out of that position and put in a guy by the name of Eliakim, 
and King Hezekiah's became King Hezekiah's uh, main right hand man. And and I say all of that to just say God took somebody out that kept the door shut up, and He gave the key to somebody who would open the door. And that's what that's talking about when the when the door uh, 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 the key of David. That means I've got the key that op- unlocks the door that all of the riches and resources of Israel can be opened up so the armies that fight against the enemy can have the resources they need to fight against the enemy out there. And God is just using that as an example to say to us that whatever you need, God has it, has it in his treasury and he will open his treasury and give you what you need. And we have found that, and I mentioned it during the, the music part, we have found that to be true. You say, how, do, how would that apply to a real life situation today? Well, you're looking at it. I mean, you're walking and you're sitting in a perfect example of God taking the key of David and open up the treasury of his resources. I know we're a small church and we've been a small church and we've been a lot smaller than this and, and we've had lots of needs and opportunities and we've had rent to pay and we've had things to build and we've had stuff to do and then we have people and then we have people that leave and people that come and we've had people that are talented people. That are, I mean, we just had all kinds of challenges and I'm just saying to you what the Lord spoke to our heart when we first started is this. He used a story in, uh, about Elijah, the prophet, yeah. and a widow woman who was about to die. And Elijah comes into the city, and, and this woman is picking up sticks on the side of the road to build a little tiny fire so that she can cook the last little bit of meal that she has that she's pressed into a little cake, like a little piece of cornbread, and she's going to cook that, and she's going to die. She and her son are going to die. And Elijah walks into town as the man of God, Everybody say, representing God. God. Elijah the prophet, representing God, walks into town. He encounters this woman. He looks at her and he said, ma'am, he said, bake me a cake. I'm hungry, which is basically like God saying, give me all that you have. Give me. Are you going to honor me? This little little woman looked and said, man, this is all we got. And and I was about to bake this little cake and me and my boy were going to eat it. And then we were going to starve to death because we don't have any more resources. And he says, well, bake me the cake first, which sounds like, you know, somebody that's self-centered and jerk, you know, but he's the man of God. And he's just basically saying, are you going to give God first? Do you love God more than yourself? Are you willing to sacrifice to God and give him everything you have? Because if you do, I got a little surprise for you. And so she baked the cake for the man of God, gave it to the man of God. He looked at her and he said, okay, because you've been obedient to God and given God everything, let me tell you what God's going to do for you. You've got a meal barrel at home. Go over there and put your hand in the meal barrel. And when she put her hand in the meal barrel, that was there, there, uh, put her bowl in, in the bowl in and scooped it out. Uh, there was enough meal for, for all of her needs. Yeah. And he said, now, every time you put that bowl in there and scoop it out, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, you're going to get what you need. Yeah. And the Bible says that her meal barrel never ran dry. In other words, because she put God first, she had everything she needed when she needed it. Now, here's the, here's the observation, and, and please follow me and hear this for your own life. God has provision for you. Now, I'm not telling you it's always going to be comfortable, and I'm not telling you that your barrel is going to run over because the Bible doesn't say that her meal barrel ran over. In other words, when she looked at it, it was still looking empty. So she could never sit back and ease and go, oh, I got it made. Look at what God did for me. No, there, there was always, she had to go over and look in the barrel and get in the barrel before she could see the blessings of God. So even though, and hear this, even though God might never run your barrel over, he will never let it run out. And the point is you get what you need when you need it. And God will do this if you'll put him first in your life, and, and, and your meal barrel won't run dry. And we have experienced that time after time after time here, whether we need a person or need talent or need money or need whatever it is we need, we can look at our books and it looks, oh my Lord, you know, we can look at, 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 at the people, we go, oh my, you know, you know, we can look out at anything we do, but every time, and we've been a church for 10 years, and I, my testimony to you is every time we need something, we just go over and reach in the barrel, and God miraculously supplies what it needs to do what we've been called to do. You're sitting in a good place. You're sitting where the Spirit of God is blessing and anointing. And he'll do that in your life also if you'll be obedient. That's the key of David. 
God has used the key of David to open up in the Freedom River what we need, and he'll use the key of David to open up your life too. So Jesus is just basically saying, look, I'm the person who has everything you need. Don't be afraid to walk through this door. Do it quickly because this door is not going to stay open forever. It's going to shut it sometime. So get out there. Use these resources. If you need some more, I got some more, and go forth. That's the one who's talking to the church at Philadelphia, and he knows that's what they need to hear, and that's what they need to be encouraged by, and he's saying that. So if you have a missionary fiery evangelistic heart that cares more about reaching other people and caring for other people's needs than you do about yourself and what's going on in your personal life. God says, I got a word for you. And here's the word he begins to speak. Here's what's right. I know your works. See, I've set before you an open door and no one can shut it for you have a little strength. You've kept my word and you've not denied my name. Basically what he's saying to you is, I've opened some doors to you. And let me just say this about the doors that have been opened up to the gospel around the world. I know we have a tendency to look at our own little communities, our own little neighborhoods, or our own life, or our own family, and we think, man, those jokers, they don't want to know the Lord. They won't listen to the things of God. Every time I bring up the subject, they want to change the subject and blah, 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 and all that kind of stuff. Well, that's the way life is, and that's the way people are. But around the world, big things are happening in the kingdom of God. And I put some of the stuff in your outline that you you need to know. And I'm going to just read this, okay? Try to save us a little time. I wrote this in your outline, but listen to this. Uh, When God opens the door, it's open. In America, we are experiencing a rapid decline in the Christian church. I don't know if you guys are aware of this. The doors of the Spirit are not shut, but nothing tests Christianity like prosperity. I'm saying to you that one of the reasons we're declining in population in this country is because we've grown fat, happy, and sassy. It's because we look at our lives and we say, I'm blessed, I have barns, I have bigger barns, and um, we become complacent. And we quit looking outside, we quit having hot hearts for God, we quit having an evangelistic heart, we turn inward, and therefore we begin to decline because we're not reaching people. We're not, we're not challenging people. We're not baptizing people. We're not bringing people to the Lord. The church, many of the churches that are growing in America are only growing because they're swapping sheep with other churches. So Christianity is on a decline in America. Now, now look at this. The fastest growing religion in America today is Islam. Islam is the most backward upside down, legalistic, judgmental, harsh, ridiculous religions of the world. And I know I may get hate mail if somebody would ever see this, but I'm just telling you the truth. I'm telling you that people that go to Islam have no idea of what it is. It is ridiculous, and yet it's the fastest growing religion in America. How ridiculous is that? The second fastest growing religion in America is Mormonism which is another ridiculously loony cult in America. Has no doctrine and belief. I mean, it's just ridiculous. The third fastest growing religion is the occult. Demonism and mysticism and magic and all of that kind of stuff. And Christianity is fourth. If current trends continue, I wrote, Islam will pass Christianity as the dominant religion in America by the year 2070. If you live to 2070 and the Lord delays his return until 2070, you'll be in a nation that is led by the religion of Islam and not by Christianity. It's ridiculous. The laws will be led by the laws of Islam and the government will be led by the laws of Islam and the representatives and the senators and the governors and the dog catcher and the mayor and will be most likely uh, Muslim and not Christian. What will that do to a country? It's just unbelievable. But secondly, last year, now listen to this, last year more people were martyred around the world for Jesus Christ than in any year in the history of the entire Christian faith. More Christians were put on chopping blocks, shot and buried in mass graves, carried off, burned with acid, set on fire, thrown away. And, 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 and there's been no outcry about this. You don't see this on CNN, MSNBC, ABC, NBC, CBS, blah, blah. You see nothing about this. It's almost like it doesn't exist. But more Christians have died around the world than, than ever in any time in the history of the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now think about that. Far more have been martyred this year than we're winning to the Lord and adding back in. 
But here's an encouraging word. The gospel in many countries around the world, the, 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 church, the, the Christian church in Africa, as an example, everybody thinks backward as Africa, tribal Africa. You think of you know, Rwanda and all these uh, apartheid and South Africa and blah, blah. You think, man, uh, you know, that's the kind of a backward place. But listen to this. Uh, the Christian church in Africa is growing so fast that missiologists, guys that study missions and growth, are saying that if AIDS doesn't destroy Africa, the entire continent may be predominantly Christian by the year 2020. Man, uh, people have rallies. People, the, 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 the Billy Graham type of, uh, of national evangelists go into Africa and set up a, a platform on, a, on an 18-wheeler bed and big speakers that can speak to people, and there'll be 2 million people standing out there and, and, and about almost two million of them will respond to Christ and say, we want Jesus. We, come on. I mean, they'll bow and confess and ask Christ in their life a, a million, two million at a time. Because the door is open. And God says, all right, while, while I open the door, walk through that door because it's not always going to be open. The door in America is slowly shutting, but it's still open. Because nothing so tests Christianity like prosperity. When you get desperate and you're in need, you have a much greater tendency to reach out for something that will give you life. But when you're fat, happy, and sassy, and your cable bill's paid, and your gas bill's paid, and nobody's repossessing your car, and you got your house note done, and sitting up there sucking down air conditioner at 68 degrees, uh, who can tell you anything? You say, you know, I'm blessed, and I'll build bigger barns, and I have need of nothing. And he says, but you're poor, blind, and naked. It's what you look like in my spot. This is what's right with the church. What's right with the church is that I've set before you an open door. No man can shut it, for you have a little strength. It doesn't mean you're powerful. This is the little church that tried. This is a small group of believers, but they're doing everything they can. And although they're not powerful, they do have some strength. So basically, he's saying is, while you have a little bit of strength, let's go. Come on now. You do, you, you're, you're tiny, but you're tough, okay? So come on. You have a little strength. You've kept my word, which is the only basis for anything spiritual. It's all based on the word of God. You cannot leave the word of God. You cannot bypass the word of God. It's not about politics. It's not about religion. It's not about, about your, your social concept. It's not about psychology. It's not about uh, correcting uh, everybody's uh, psychological maladies and so forth. That's not what changes the world. What changes the world is the word of God. And he says, you have kept my word. Good. That's your foundation. And he says, and you've not denied my name which is another vital aspect of life. I don't know if you're really aware of this, but the name of God is something that is powerful in this world. You say, well, I, you know, the name of God, Jehovah, Yahweh, Jesus, God, uh, you know, what, what, what about the name? Let me just say this to you. Do you remember the Ten Commandments? Do you remember one of the Ten Commandments? One of the Ten Commandments, he said, I'm the Lord your God, I'm a jealous God. You shouldn't have any other gods before me. And then he comes on down and he says, he says, remember my, remember my name, keep it holy. And people think because you don't say, you don't use curse words like GD, that you somehow have not violated that commandment. You say, I never say anything like that. Well, congratulations, I'm glad because it just shows how cheap you might be and ignorant because you don't know another word to say besides that. Come on, you can come up with a lot of words, right? You're educated and sharp. Why do you have to say something like that? It's ridiculous. It doesn't reflect on the kingdom of God at all, positively. So I'm not saying you should say something like that. I'm just saying that's not, that's not what he's talking about. Some think because you don't use words like that, you haven't violated that commandment. But let me tell you what, what the name means. The name, your name represents all that you are and all that you will. If I use your name, I'm basically saying this is what Billy is and this is what Billy wills. So in Billy's name, I'm going to say this, I'm going to do this, and it reflects on who he is and what his will is. So to dishonor the name of God, what it means is 
that we do things calling ourselves Christians representing the name of God that is not reflective of who God is at all and it's not reflective of what his will is at all and by doing that, we dishonor his name. And so he's just saying, you have obeyed my word and you have kept my name pure. The things you do in the name of Christ, in the name of God, reflect positively on who I am and what I'm about in this world. So that's a good word to say to them. And so they have an opportunity to do great things because they have done, they, they, they've done all of those things. And so here he is, what's wrong? You know, you could preach this sermon right here. What's wrong? Nothing, not a thing. Didn't have anything to say negative to them. Didn't say anything was wrong with them. This is the missionary evangelistic church. This is a church that is in his will, in his purpose, doing his plan. What is he going to say negative to them? There's nothing negative to say. This is a church that has the heart of God, the compassion of God, the love of God, the faith of God, the reputation of God. They're doing everything they can for the kingdom of God. What is it negative to say? Nothing. So what does Jesus say negative? Nothing. So he goes on to say, let me give you a little bit of counsel now. And here's in verse 8, I know your works, okay, good. He says that to every one of the churches. That's just so you'll know. I'm not saying this on hearsay. I know what you're doing. I see what you're doing. See, I've set before you an open door and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength and you've kept my word and you have not uh, violated my name. So God says, I've opened the door to you and, 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 and nobody's going to close it. And then I'm going to keep it open for a while, but eventually it's going to shut. So you need to do what you do. Now, here's verse 9. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Now, let me just talk about that for just a second. Uh, you may not be aware of this, but... The Jewish faith all through the Old Testament, the Jews, God's covenant people, God's chosen people, God spoke to them and led them and, 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 and asked them to do certain ceremonies and sacrifices and, and certain things that they did all as an opportunity for all of them to live a life that would be receptive to a Messiah that would come that could be the savior of their life. Everything about the tabernacle, everything about the temple, everything about the sacrifices were to lead them to understand that these things are just analogies. These are pictures of a Messiah that will come. The blood of an innocent animal shed to cover the sins of a guilty human is meant to make you ready to receive the fact that an innocent lamb can die on a cross and his blood is going to wash you clean and make you white as snow. The gold of the temple represents the glory of God. The precious stones, the rubies, the diamonds, the jewels, the, the gate, the brass gates. All of these are just symbols. The brass is the judgment of God. When you walk through that gate, you walk into judgment. When you walk over to an altar and you hang a bull up there and his blood drops down there and the smoke goes up and over the tabernacle of God, you just begin to see the smoke suck in toward the top of that tent like, like God is inhaling your sacrifice which meant you made it. That's a great sacrifice. Everybody's confessed their sin. What's well, to show you that, the, that God's going to forgive your sin through a Messiah and a Savior that's going to come. And somebody who is a true Jew, according to what Jesus says here, is somebody who as a Jew has received Jesus Christ as their Messiah, who got the message who saw everything in the Old Testament as an example to lead you to Christ and give you a picture of Christ, and you saw it and you believe they're called Messianic Jews. Around this country and around other places of the world, there are pockets of Messianic Jews. A Messianic Jew would just be a completed Jew. You say, what is a completed Jew? A completed Jew is somebody who understand Judaism and went through the practices and so forth, and that led them to see who Jesus really was, and they opened their heart, and they asked Christ to come in just like you did in order to be completed, and they followed Christ, and now they follow Jesus just like you follow Jesus. That's a true Jew. This bunch of fake off-brand junk that we have going on nowadays where somebody wants to sacrifice and practice Old Testament theology and all of that kind of stuff and call themselves a, a Christian, that's just, it's ridiculous. It's, it's, it's oxymoronic. It's, it, 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 it's ludicrous. Where's Jesus? It's everything but Jesus. And so Jesus said, I'm talking about those true Jews, not the ones that say they're Jews, but they lie. 
Indeed, I'll make them come and worship before your feet, and, and they'll know that I, that I have loved you. In other words, I'm going, what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to so elevate you and who you are and what you are in Christ that they're going to come and they're going to bow, which is an act of submission, before your feet because they're going to see everything I'm doing in you, and they're going to, they're going to say, I'm sorry, what have we done? And, and, and they're going to be drawn to Christ, and they're going to submit before you because they can see the truth that the reason you're blessed and the reason you're going forward is because I love you so much. And if they'll surrender and submit, I'll love them just like I love you. Because you know what judgment is intended to do? There are two reasons why God brings judgment against people. One of them is for disciplinary purposes. One of them is you do bad things, you know, you get judged. The hammer falls on you. You don't have what you need. You're out here swinging in the breeze all by yourself. That's disciplinary. It's to say to you, quit doing that. Recognize that your need. But the other reason for discipline is exemplary, which simply means to show other people they don't need to do what you do because you see the judgment falling on your life and, and they look at you and go, wait a minute, I don't want to do that because, man, God did that to them. What would he do to me? So he's just saying in this verse, because you're following me and you've not defiled my name, I'm going to make those people that have not followed me see what I'm doing in your life, see how much I love you and what blessings follow with that, and they're going to bow at your feet and say, oh, my goodness, God is blessing you. How can we have what you have in life? So the counsel is keep on doing what you're doing. Now, here's some more stuff, and I'm sorry I didn't put this in your note, but this is just, I'll give it to you real quick. Verse 10, because you have kept my command to persevere... I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those that dwell upon the earth. What hour is he talking about? Well, you're going to see it in a few weeks because we'll, we'll actually be there. It's a period on this earth called the tribulation. You've heard that word before, right? The tribulation is going to come on this earth once God has removed his true church. And I'll show you that, and I believe I can help you understand that that's the total truth about it. There's a lot of argument theologically about when the church gets taken off this earth. Some say uh, at the beginning of the, of the tribulation. Some say in the middle of the tribulation. Some say at the end of the tribulation. But I believe the Bible teaches clearly, very clearly, that before all the tribulation begins to happen on the earth that is intended to test those who dwell upon the earth, that God's people have been called out. And I'll have, there'll be many passages in Revelation that'll say that to you. But what he's saying here is, he's saying, because you're true, because you're holy, because you have a right relationship with me, I, you're not going to have to go through this period, which is a, a, another verse that just helps identify the fact that the true believers, the true church of the Lord Jesus will not be here during that terrible time which shall come upon the earth that's going to test everybody. Believe me, you don't want to be there. I guarantee you, you'll see. It's horrible. It's ridiculous. It's Man, it's terrible. It is tribulation. But he's saying to this church of true believers, if, if, you'll, if you'll walk with me like you're walking with me, you'll do the thing. Uh, I'm not going to make you go through that thing, indicating that they will be taken away before all of that kind of stuff happens. Behold, I come quickly. In other words, you better, better do what you're going to do now because uh, there's no telling it's going to happen fast. When that hour rings, when that minute chimes, I don't know when it is. You don't know when it is. Nobody knows when it is. But there is a moment when the door swings closed and the trump of God sounds and boom, it's done quickly. So be prepared because it could happen at any moment. Hold fast what you have that no one may take your crown. In the Bible, there are five crowns that are mentioned. There's the incorruptible crown, which is a crown for those that have stayed faithful to the Lord. There's the crown of righteousness, which I believe every believer, you're a Christian, you know the Lord. You have bowed your knee. You have confessed that Jesus Christ is Lord. You've waved the white flag and surrendered and said, Jesus, change my life, save my soul, be my master, be my boss, be my Lord. I surrender to you. I'm obedient to you. I believe every single believer has at least one of these crowns, and you have a crown of righteousness, I believe. Of course, it doesn't matter what the label is, but you have a crown. 
if you belong to Jesus. So you have an incorruptible crown if you've really kept yourself truly clean. You have a crown of righteousness, so you have at least one crown. There's a crown of glory, which is for those who preach and minister the gospel. Then there's the crown of life for those that have been martyred and given their life for the faith of Jesus Christ. And then there's one final crown called the crown of, the crown of rejoicing. The crown of rejoicing is for people who win other people to Jesus. It's called the soul winner's crown. And what Jesus is saying to them is, look, keep on doing what you're doing and nobody else will, get, will take the crown of rejoicing away from you. In other words, if you keep winning souls, if you keep sharing the faith, if you keep expanding the kingdom, you're going to get a crown for it. Don't stop doing what you do and let some Johnny come lately come and get your crown at the end. So he's encouraging them. He's saying, keep on doing what you're doing. Uh, you're true and right, and I'm not going to let you go through all this terrible time of tribulation, and you're going to get a crown. Don't, don't stop doing what you're doing and let somebody slip up on the outside and get the crown of righteousness that no one may take. I mean, the crown of, of rejoicing that no one may take your crown. He who overcomes, I'll make him a pillar in the temple of my God. That's just talking about the fact that everybody understands in this society back here that these big temples, all of these big pagan temples and heathen temples and even temples that are supposed to represent God have these gigantic pillars in front of them. And it's an honorable thing. It's a noble thing. It's a mighty thing to have your name carved in one of those temple pillars up there. It's a sign of respect, a, time, a sign of honor. It's, it's unbelievable. And God says, look, I'm going to make you a pillar in my temple. I'm, gonna, I'm building a temple, and you're going to be one of the pillars that hold the temple up. Boy, that's a tremendously great word. If you'll allow me to come into your heart, go to the cross, have your life changed, ha have your soul saved, then you'll become one of those temples in the pillar of God. And then he says, and you shall go out no more. What in the world is that talking about? Well, if you'll notice in your notes, I put this little piece of information that you need to hear because this is why he said this exact phrase to them. In the, in, in the, in the city of Philadelphia, by the way, the name means brotherly love, which is a great name. Phileo, which is the Greek word for, for love, and Delphi, which means like a brother. So phileo is love you like a brother. We have people in our lives, you know, we love like brothers. They're not family, but we love them like a brother, even though they may not be part of our family. We love you as if you were part of our family. What an appropriate name for a missionary evangelistic church that loved other people more than they loved themselves. But he said, I'm going to make you a pillar of my temple. And then he says, and you shall go out no more. Because here's, here's what was happening in Philadelphia. In 17 AD, there was a tremendously gigantic earthquake. And this earthquake almost flattened the city of Philadelphia and the surrounding cities. Some of these other churches were in, you know, the Sardis and the Pergamos and all. A tremendously great earthquake. Well, for the next 140 years, six times, there were these gigantic tremors. And they would just happen, you know, uh, 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 sporadically. Just at any moment, all of a sudden, the ground might start shaking, and everything that Philadelphia had done got shaken back down again, and the people would have to pack up all their belongings at a minute's notice and run out of the city to save their lives. So when Jesus says, look, here's one of the things I'm going to promise you as an overcomer. As an overcomer, I'm going to promise you that if you'll allow me to lead your life, you're going to become the pillars. You're going to become one of the stalwarts of the kingdom of God, and you're not ever going to have to run away anymore because my, my kingdom is not going to be shaken. You're not going to have to pick up your bags every 25 years and run for your life while you watch your house fall down around you. In other words, those of us on the coast, we understand this. It'd be like God looking at us and saying, uh, you, you, you give yourself to me and Katrina's never going to flood your house again. You're never going to have to run for your life again. So it's a tremendously great promise and he shall go out no more. Now the next three have to do with being marked. You know, when, when someone was a slave, and I'm not just talking about in the recent 200 year of America, I'm talking about slaves. Do, do you realize that ever since there have been people on this earth, somebody's been a slave? Do you realize this? I mean, the first, first, the first kingdom that was ever established on this earth, the first group of people, there were slaves. And there always has been. And some of them have been, 
you know, Asian, some of them have been Anglo, some of them have been African, some of them, I mean, every group of people on the earth have been slaves at one time or another. Right now, there are slaves all over the world. We don't have slaves in America, except all of us are slaves to the government and the IRS, but, but I mean, you know, you know, I mean, technically, they're not any slaves, but I'm talking about real slaves. There are places on this earth you go to, there are people that are sold to other people, and, they're, and, 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 and those people own them like you would own a cattle or sheep or anything else. Slavery still exists around the world. We fought a war, what, 100 years ago? Or a little more than 100 years ago to stop the slavery in America. The only country in the history of the world to ever do so, by the way. And so we don't have it anymore. But there are countries that still do. And on these slaves in many areas, they are branded. They have a mark on them uh, to identify who their owner is. And what this next three things are talking about is God is branding you. So that you, everybody will know that you are his. So that you'll never have to speak and say, I belong to God because all they'll do is look at the brand on you and it'll say Jehovah. It'll say Yahweh. You know, it'll be God's name. And so he says, I will write on him the name of my God. In the Old Testament, the name of God was Jehovah or Yahweh or Elohim. One of those names might be on you somewhere. I have no idea how to even envision that. But God says, if you'll you'll stay true to me, I'm going to brand my name on you so when somebody sees you, they won't have to wonder who you belong to because my name's going to be stamped in you. And then he says, and the city of my God. Now, this refers to a time that is yet to come. And you're going to see this in the, as we look through the book of Revelation. You're going to, there, we spend a lot of time at the end looking at the new heaven and the new earth. And there's a new city of Jerusalem coming down from heaven created by God. And I know this may sound a little wild and out there to you. But the point is that in the kingdom of God, once Jesus takes us to heaven and we no longer inhabit the earth... We're going to be with Jesus wherever he is. And when he creates the new heaven and the new earth and the new Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem becomes the capital city of the kingdom of God. And if you can picture it like this, and this is the only way I have to even, you know, remotely explain, and I don't even know if I'm right about this, but what it appears to be is like the new heaven is here and the new earth is here. It's all the kingdom of God. It's not like it is now. It's not, it's not polluted. It's not, it's not wild. It's not wicked. It doesn't have sin everywhere. It's the new earth. It's the new heaven. Only the righteous are there and the kingdom of God and Jesus rules and reigns and God the Father. And, and right in between them, there's a capital city, so to speak, called the New Jerusalem. Well, in our glorified body, we're going to be able to travel everywhere within the kingdom of God. And what Jesus is saying here is, if you'll stay true, if you'll remain close to me, if you'll not deny my name, and you'll keep our relationship pure, when we get to the kingdom of God, when you you go somewhere, when you go to the new heaven or you go to the new earth, and the people look at you that are also redeemed like you, you won't have to hear the question, where are you from? Because it'll be stamped and marked in you, New Jerusalem. Which means, where, nobody will have to say, where are you from, boy? New Jerusalem, nobody will ever have to ask you that because you'll have the name of your city stamped in you. So his promise is, look, man, you stay true to me. You come to the cross, let me overcome your life. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to brand you with my name so nobody will ever have to ask you. And I'm going to brand you with the city you belong to, the New Jerusalem. And then look at this last one, which comes down from heaven out of uh, uh, from my God, and I will write, write on him my new name. So on you is stamped the name of the old name of God. The old name in the Old Testament was Jehovah, Yahweh, Elohim, one of those names. The new name for God is Jesus. In the New Testament, God's name is Jesus. But Jesus said, I got a new name for you. Now, just so you'll know, Jesus gets a new name too. 
in Revelation 19, and you'll see it when we get there, and it's way more amazing than I could give you in this just couple of minutes. But the Bible in, in, in Revelation 19 says that, that, that John said, man, I looked at heaven, and what I saw is I saw, I saw a white horse. And him that sat on the white horse was called faithful and true. So in, ver, in verse 11, it says his name is faithful and true. And then in verse, in, in, in verse 14, 13, it says, and, 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 and out of his eyes came a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and on, his, and on him was written a name, the word of God. So in Revelation 19, Jesus has two names. He has faithful and true, and he has the word of God. And then right in the middle, verse 12, it says, and, 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 and on him, he had a vesture. Everybody say a robe. He had a robe, and this robe, the Bible says, and this robe was dipped in blood. So Jesus is on a white horse with a robe that's dipped in blood. And his eyes are shooting out fire, and on his head are many crowns, and he has written faithful and true on one side and the word of God on the other side. And it says, and he had a new name that no man knew but he himself. So that new name that Jesus gets, he said, I've got a new name for you. Now, I don't know what your new name's going to be, but I think, it, I think I know what it's going to be about. What it's going to be about is your nickname. How many of you have somebody you love in your life, and you just love them, you know them, uh, they're precious to you, you love them, and you have a love name for them, right? Because of what they mean to you and how you love them, you have, call, you have, you have a new name. Their name is Jonathan Boa Weevil Van Shuck or something, whatever it might be. But you don't call him Bo or Weevil or, you know, Johnny or whatever. Yeah, you call him, you call him Sunshine. Sunshine. <laughs> because he's sunshine to your soul. He's a delight to your heart. So Jonathan Bo Weevil has a new name called Sunshine. And Jesus said, I know you. I have a, I have a love name for you. And when you get here, I'm going to stamp that love name on you, and for the rest of eternity, you're going to be sunshine. That's who you're going to be. When I talk to you, I'm not saying, Johnny Bowl, come on. I'm saying, sunshine, come, and you're going to have sunshine stamped on you. See, these are tremendous promises for God. He's just saying to you, if you will love me and stay faithful to me and honor the word of God and walk in the name of God and don't misrepresent me and don't blaspheme me and don't you know, be, be disloyal, think about others more than yourself, you're going to have some great rewards in the kingdom of God. And I'm saying that to you. And I'm saying, look, look at your own life. Think about what God's saying to you. We're now living in the things which are. We're going to the things which shall be hereafter. And I'm just saying that once those things that begin to happen, the Bible describes that are going to happen, once they begin to happen, they happen quickly. Boom, 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 boom. We'll talk about that next week. There's a verse that says some stuff, and I think you'll need to hear it. But, but I'm just telling you, boom, 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 and then boom, it's gone. Now, believe me, you're, we're in the boom, boom, boom. We're fixing to go boom, 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 gone. And you don't want to be left. Because believe me, you're going to see it's the greatest time of tribulation this world's ever seen or ever will see. So don't, the door's open right now. The, God's kingdom is open to you. His spirit is convicting you. You say, how do I know? Well, how do you feel? Are you, are you concerned? Are you anxious? You're a little nervous? You're saying, man, I should have skipped this Sunday. <laughs> I don't, man, that's scary to me. Okay, you know what that means? That means there's still time for you. You ought to be happy about that because that's the Spirit of God on the inside of you saying, boy, you better get serious. You better get right. And so I'm just saying to you, now's the time. And how do you do that? Well, you surrender. When Jesus says that if any man shall confess with his mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in his heart that God has raised him from the dead, he shall be saved. Romans 10, 9, and 10. That's how you get saved. That's how you cross from 
not in the kingdom to end the kingdom is if you will confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that just simply means he's boss, he's master. What does Lord mean? Lord means the owner. That means you can't be boss anymore. You can't be master. It means I wave the white flag and I say, Jesus Christ, I'm giving myself to you and I don't have any more authority to my life. I give it completely to you. Can you say that to him? Has that, it, when, when you said that years ago, is that what you meant? When you were baptized, before you were baptized to show that you belong to Jesus, because baptism doesn't save you, I'm going to tell you that. It's merely a picture of what happened with your soul dying to yourself and being brought up in new life. So I don't care if you've been baptized a hundred times and know every fish in the lake by personal name. <laughs> that doesn't mean you're going to heaven. What means you're going to heaven is if you've bowed your heart to Christ and said, Jesus, you're my owner, you're Lord, you're Papa, you're Master, and I'm not the king of my life anymore. Yeah. And if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that's why we ask you at the end, come down here and, 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 and talk to the pastor and say, I've received Christ. You're confessing with your mouth that what has happened in your heart, then you shall be saved. So do it right now. This is the time. This is what this whole... The book of Revelation is not to show you weird things. The book of Revelation is to show you Jesus Christ and to let you know how desperately you need Jesus Christ and how short the time is and how urgent the message is that you would respond to Jesus Christ, that the people you love and the people you care for might be called to Jesus Christ. And so the message of the seven churches is tell them like it is. Well, like it is is you still have a chance, but you need to do what you do quickly because there's no guarantee that open door is going to stay open because when God shuts it, I'm not going to be able to open it for you. Nobody's not. <laughs> His mercy doesn't last forever. The Bible says that the Spirit of God will not, always, will not always strive with man, which just simply means at some point the Spirit of God is going to move off and leave you like you are which is a horrible thing. I know you said, just leave me alone. Me, me, me. The only thing you don't want is God to leave you alone. That means there's no hope for you. Phew. Boy, that'd be a desperate time.